Hi, everyone. I'm Tim McDonald, Deputy Director of the Pasadena Public Library. Welcome. We're so glad you could join us for tonight's One City, One Story Summer Author Event sponsored by the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. I have just a few brief um, housekeeping matters to go over before the program. Three things that will help optimize everyone's viewing experience today. Number one, for our panelists, I ask that you mute your microphones if you're not speaking. That will help make sure everybody can hear our speakers clearly. Number two, some good news, we are recording today's event. And um, thank you um, for the permission that our author, Connor Knighton, has granted for us to, to do that. After today's program, we'll send the information out to everyone who registered for this event to have access to the recording afterwards so you can watch it again or share it with somebody that wasn't able to attend. Uh, I can also assure you that the images, the faces, and the voices of our speakers only will be recorded. You in the audience, um, if you're home in your pajamas watching the show, uh, no one will be the wiser. So we're only recording our speakers today. And number three, um, questions and answers. Uh, we would love to answer as many questions from the audience as we can today. And I'll just take a moment to go over how to do that. Because um, I think it's for many of us that have been on Zoom for the last year, uh, it may be second nature. But to those that, that aren't as experienced, it may be worth just taking a minute to go over that. If you take the mouse on your computer and wiggle it a little bit, and hover it over the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see some icons appear at the bottom of your screen. And toward the center, there'll be one at the bottom that says Q&A. If you click on that once, a box is gonna open up and you can type your question in that box and hit send. We will answer, uh, we will ask as many of those questions as time allows to our speaker tonight. Again, that's the Q&A function. Don't confuse that with the chat function. It's the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So that's it. Let's stay muted. Look for the information about the recording and send us your questions so that we can ask them to the author. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our library director, Michelle Pereira. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm so thrilled that we have this great event for you, and I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from Connor. He's just delightful to talk to, and um, I, I know his presentation is going to be wonderful. Um, I just want to acknowledge that 2021 is uh, the 19th anniversary of the One City, One Story. That's um, a lot of years of doing this, and we can't wait for the 20th anniversary next year. Um, One City, One Story is a program that's designed to broaden and deepen an appreciation of reading and literature. And really by comp um, recommending compelling book to read that we can all read together and that will spark some community conversation. And I think a book about national parks um, during a year like this that we've had is just the perfect selection. Um, obviously our uh, guest of honor here is Connor Knighton and the author of Leave Only Footprints, My Acadia to Zion Journey Through Every National Park. Um, I, I, I do wanna acknowledge our 14 member uh, selection committee that uh, spent the entire uh, summer last year reading reading books to determine our selections for our two 2021 One City, One Story. And they are Sharon Culkin, Rosemary Choate, Manuela gomez Rhine, Nancy Hamill, Sally Cooser, Brooke Larson Garlock, Kayla McCulley, Maggie Reyes Rothner, Mary Schuler, Arnie Siegel, Jolly Erner, and Larry Wilson. And a big thank you to Christine Reeder, who uh, puts all of our uh, One City, One Story programs together and does just a fabulous job. And um, before we, 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 we get started here, just a little bit about um, Mr. Knighton and um, uh, his background. Um, he's an Emmy-winning correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning, America's number one Sunday morning news program. And depending on your cable package, you may have seen him hosting shows on Current TV, AMC, and the Biography Channel, or providing commentary on things like MTV, E, or CNN. And believe it or not, as the book suggests, he has been to all of the national parks. And this is his debut nonfiction book, Leave Only Footprints, and has just become a New York Times bestseller. So what, kudos to Mr. Knighton. Um, when, when Connor decided to set off to explore um, the America's um, national parks, 
Um, he refers to them, obviously, and so do many as the best idea, but he worried the whole thing could turn up to be the worst idea to go to each one of them. Um, a broken engagement and a broken heart had left him longing for a change of scenery, but the plan he'd cooked up in response had gone a bit overboard in that department. Over the course of a single year, Connor visited every national park in the country from Acadia to Zion. And, you know, we're, like I said, we're thrilled to have him here. I would um, like to turn this over um, to our Mayor Gordo, who we appreciate joining us today and um, is uh, always a fan of our One City, One Story and introducing our authors. So over to you, Mr. Gordo. Thank you, Michelle. And, and first off, let me just uh, thank Michelle and her staff for putting together a terrific event. Um, you know, I, 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 like all of you, am waiting to, for all of us to be in person, uh, to be able to see one another in person uh, and share in this experience uh, as we've done for um, 19 years now. Um, and it's, it's a tremendous tradition. You know, one of the, one of the great things about Pasadena is uh, people love to read and to have uh, this book uh, by Connor Knighton uh, as a special treat during the summer uh, is really a guide through our national parks. It's really an opportunity to blend together uh, our love for the outdoors uh, together with our love for reading. So I wanna thank Connor for bringing us this book. I'd like to thank the 14 member uh, selection committee for always doing a great job and delivering uh, something that uh, all Pasadena can read, uh, that we can discuss, talk about, uh, and share um, among ourselves and, and our neighbors. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this event. Uh, you know, the Friends uh, truly are friends uh, and do a terrific job of assisting and augmenting uh, what the city staff does in terms of uh, providing services at the library. And so I'd like to thank all of the friends of the library for um, their terrific efforts on, on behalf of all of uh, all of us and residents of Pasadena. And uh, to the author, again, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for being here with us and sharing um, your book and uh, your experiences. And we can't wait to have uh, all of the discussions that we're hoping to have uh, soon enough. So this will launch us into those discussions and I welcome everyone, thank everyone. And uh, Michelle, back to you. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having me as always. Thank you. So I, I think we're, um, we're gonna turn this over to Connor. We're all gonna turn our video off as we uh, videotape this. And uh, thank you for joining us, Connor Knighton. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mayor Gordo. Thank you to the Pasadena Library, to the friends of the library, to the selection committee. Uh, I'm honored to be selected and I, I have such a love uh, for Pasadena. Um, I lived in Pasadena before I lived nowhere um, and, and, and gave up my place and, and hit the road to see all of the national parks. Uh, so I'd like to kick things off actually with uh, a paragraph from the book, just a quick reading that uh, sort of is, uh, takes place right at that moment where I was wondering if this whole thing might be the worst idea, if, if I was overcompensating when my friends told me I needed a change of scenery after recovering from this broken engagement. I'm sure every national park in the country is not what they had in mind, but I'd seen a news article about the upcoming centennial of the National Park Service in uh, 2016. This was happening in late 2015, and it seemed like that might be just what I needed. And so uh, here's the paragraph I'm referencing. I also worried that I was just running away from something. It certainly looked like I was. But when I'd flipped through the books I'd checked out from the library, marveling at photos of one natural wonder after another, the parks felt more like something I wanted to run toward. I felt drawn to these places, peaks and streams and fields and valleys that had existed for millions of years, but had waited until this specific year to turn their siren song on me. Or, in the words of naturalist John Muir, whom I'd started reading voraciously, the mountains are calling and I must go. So I went which is how I found myself in hiking pants in South Dakota on what was supposed to be my wedding day, barreling toward my 25th National Park of the Year. So the those books I checked out from the library, that was the Pasadena Library. Um, I lived six blocks from the library um, uh, and two blocks from Romans. Um, so I was, I was just in a, the, the most book central area of Pasadena you can imagine. 
Uh, I think there's a while there where I was keeping uh, Lucky Boy and Blaze Pizza and Tender Greens in business. I, I'm a very terrible cook, but a very good patron of uh, Pasadena's restaurants in that uh, little uh, triangle. Um, and so I, I, I love the Pasadena Library, so it's a special treat uh, to, to be back to, to talk about that. Um, and so, you know, basically, th those books I was checking out were were guidebooks, but but no no one writes a guidebook for every national park because what insane person would try and tackle that all in a year? You know, you might find a guidebook for Yosemite for Yellowstone, um, but but for all of them, that's that's not really um, a, a quest that if you take it on, it's a lifetime goal. And honestly, that's more of a, a sane way to do that. Um, but I decided to go all in. Um, and partially that's because uh, long before I was an author, uh, I was and am a correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning. And so I'd convinced my bosses at Sunday Morning that they might like to air some stories about the parks. You know, not, not all of them. Um, at the time, there were 59 national parks. There are now 63. Um, so even if you did one every Sunday, we couldn't have fit them all into a year. Um, but about a third is what they agreed to for the broadcast. Um, and, and to this day, it remains the most outlandish pitch that I've ever sent. I did not, I was a freelance correspondent. I didn't really work for them, but I just sort of sold them on this idea and that I was the right guy for it. Remarkably, they said yes. And then I decided to make up the difference on my own because if we were going to some of these places, places like, you know, remote parts of Alaska, you know, uh, rural Utah, when am I ever going to get back there again? So I decided that instead of paying uh, to live in Pasadena full time, which as you all know, can, can be very expensive. Um, I would take that money that I had been spending on rent for my apartment and use it to supplement uh, where I was heading for work. So I kind of never came home. I would film a story for Sunday morning and then use my own money for an Airbnb. I'd cash in some Hilton points, whatever it ended up being. Um, and so I never came back. I think had I been occasionally returning and like going to sugar fish on lake or something like that that would have been a weirder headspace to be in i think in some ways it was just easier to stay in nature mode for the full year um, and really immerse myself in these places so you could argue the book could be called peace out pasadena one man's journey <laughs> as far from the rose bowl as possible but it was it was not not a uh, any uh negative aspect of pasadena that caused me to leave it was just that the the, the parks had that pull for me in it, and I needed to change things up um, because of of my personal life, and just you know, it, it ended up being able to to overlap some with my professional life. Um, I think one advantage that seeing every national park and not just some of them uh, ended up providing me with was that I was able to see some threads that tie them together, and so that's why in the book I've structured it by theme and not by chronology, which would be you know, a, a more traditional way to, to start in January and finish in December, or by region. Um, but if you've ever looked at a map of the national parks, those regions are a little lopsided. California has nine national parks, more than any other state. And so it would have been a lot of California, and then like a tiny little chapter about Texas, and then a small chapter about Arkansas. Um, but linking Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas and Biscayne National Park in Florida, or linking uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park in California and Volcanoes National Park in Hawaii ended up making more sense to me. Sometimes there were literal themes like that, like volcanoes, and sometimes there were more abstract themes uh, like God and spirituality. So a place like Yosemite, um, uh, which was was sort of legendarily documented in John Muir's writings about the, the spiritual experiences he had there, um, was able to you know, overlap with, with other parks that where, where I did feel more of a, a spiritual connection myself. Um, so, uh, but the California ones, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not just kissing up to a California audience with this, are some of the best. I mean, it has more parks than any other state. Alaska has the second most, it has eight. Um, but those nine in California, not only are they all-star national parks, but they're so different from one another. Uh, Utah has the mighty five. And so that would be Bryce, Capitol Reef, Canyonlands, uh, Zion, and Arches. And sometimes when people ask me about my favorite national park, that trip, hitting all five of those, which you can do because they're in a, a smaller area, um, is a, just a, a fantastic trip. But you know, that's a lot of red rock scenery, which, which I really enjoy, which is why I like those parks. But if you're looking for sheer diversity of parks, bone dry Death Valley and, and the misty lush redwoods in Northern California, Lassen Volcanic and, and the Channel Islands, Joshua Tree. I mean, they're just so drastically different that it really, it really makes you appreciate the scenic diversity 
uh, that California has. Um, and yes, it is a big state, but but you know, Texas is a big state, and and it looks a little uh, more similar. Um, uh, so the those California parks remain some of my favorites. And I was surprised after living in California for a decade, how many of them I'd never heard of. I mean, certainly I knew Yosemite, I knew Joshua Tree. I'd been to Joshua Tree before. I'd been to Yosemite before. Um, but Lassen Volcanic, like. Yeah, partially it's a weird name. It seems like it's got like an adjective thrown in there that doesn't really modify anything. Um, but I'd never heard of that park before. In a way, that's what convinced me that this might be a, a series that, that could stand on our broadcast and then eventually in a book where when there was a good half of the parks uh, across the country, Kobuk Valley, Cuyahoga Valley in Ohio, I'd never heard of. Uh, there's just, just a range of these parks that were new to me. And I, I felt like if they were new to me, that that might be true for a lot of folks. Pinnacles National Park, I'd never been to, just a couple hours south, uh, south of San Francisco. But for some of those major ones, like Yosemite, when I started the journey, when I when I packed up and left Pasadena, and I, I was thinking about, well, which third am I going to, to tell on Sunday morning? I thought, for sure, I'm going to tell Yosemite. How can you not? For sure, I'll tell Yellowstone. Um, I ended up not doing either of those parks for our broadcast. And I think it's because they're they're well known. Um, I found from a storytelling perspective, I gravitated more towards places like Great Sand Dunes, like uh, like Cuyahoga Valley, places that like the National Park of American Samoa, um, which which I, I did not know was a park. And I think most people don't know that much about American Samoa as a territory. Um, those were, were more compelling starting points for me. Ken Burns has done Yosemite really well. And if you haven't, uh, you know, seen his his PBS documentary, or they actually made a book of it as well with Dayton Duncan. I, I highly recommend you check that out. They they cover that well as did as did junior high school history. Um, but some of those lesser known parks uh, really really uh, spark my interest. Um, for California, I do talk some, uh, particularly in the trees chapter. California, and I didn't realize this really until I was on the trail, has is more than any other state has celebrity trees, trees that are just superlatives in their field. So uh, whether that's uh, the uh, largest tree, which would be the General Sherman um, at uh, Sequoia National Park, the tallest tree, which is a tree at Redwood National Park named Hyperion that to this day I've never seen, or maybe I have because you don't they don't tell you where it is. Uh, they're afraid that if word gets out about where Hyperion is, what it is, um, it will be the you know, everyone will, will there'll be an influx of visitors. Uh, so it's, uh, and from the ground, the difference between 300 feet and 350 feet or 357 feet is, is uh, uh, negligible. So they all look pretty tall and impressive. But there's also the oldest tree um, in the countries in California. Uh, that I, is not in a national park. I believe that's in a national forest, um, but it's a, a bristlecone pine that, that's uh, sort of way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, and then the Joshua tree, which I learned was not really a tree. Um, uh, is a, a, a yucca brevifolia is technically what that is, but certainly everyone uh, refers to it as a tree and, and I do as well. Um, the, when it came time to write the book, now these were all in my, my rear view. I finished at Point Reyes National Seashore, um, another California connection that's a little north of San Francisco. Uh, it's where the sun sets last in the contiguous US. Um, and uh, even that is only true on New Year's Eve. It, it's a it's a point that moves around. Um, uh, but I'd emailed the Navy uh, because I wanted to have the longest year possible, and so I, I made sure to finish at that 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 final place. Um, and and I think this is worth. Uh, I probably should have started with this. Um, that Point Reyes is a national seashore, and this is the the most common question I get all the time. It happened while I was on the trail. It happened before and after the book came out. Um, why aren't you talking about X, Y, or Z place? Um, because people see the flat hats that the Rangers wear, they see the, the Park Service logo, and you, you will see that at a place like Point Reyes, which is managed by the National Park Service, but it is not technically a national park. And so the distinction there is national parks are created by an act of Congress. Uh, and so, whereas presidents can designate national monuments and battlefields and a whole host of, of other things. So the Park Service manages 400 and some units. Um, uh, there's a number in California. Some are, are more historical sites, you know, places like uh, Stonewall in New York, that's managed by the Park Service. Uh, there's uh, two rooms in a house in Philadelphia uh, that, that are managed by the Park Service. In most cases, the more marquee kinds of locations are national parks, but not always. Um, Hot Springs is a national park in the middle of a city. It's not this wide expanse of, of nature. 
uh, in the year, uh, in the years since I finished my quest, um, they have added four more. I have been to all of those. And most recently, actually just a month ago, uh, I made a return visit um, to New River Gorge, uh, which was formerly a national river, is now New River Gorge National Park, and is an hour from where I grew up in West Virginia. Um, so uh, proof uh, of that, that Wizard of Oz sentiment that sometimes, you know, the, the treasures are lurking in your own backyard all the time, and you, you don't even realize it. Um, and so for me, that was New River Gorge, which is now getting a little bit more attention because it's a park. Uh, the other few would be uh, Indiana Dunes uh, in, in near Chicago, Gateway Arch, which is in the middle of St. Louis, um, and then White Sands. And in all those cases, they were redesignations. So there has not been a grain of sand that has changed at White Sands. Uh, it is just formerly a national monument, now a national park. Sometimes it really just comes down to a branding thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a future in which all 400, some of those things be become national parks, um, just and, and they eliminate all those distinctions of battlefields and historical sites because it does get a little uh, confusing. But but for now, uh, though, those are those are the that's the the list is the 63. The newest in California is Pinnacles, and when I went, that was that was the newest park, um, and that was uh, an Obama designation that was a few years old by the time I hit the trail. And then there's just been this flurry of activity. I think as people realize, fair or unfair. That sometimes the parks get more attention. Local representatives have, have advocated for their spots getting park status. Um, the uh, in terms of treasures lurking in your own backyard, the one that I'd never been to, and it, it is the closest to Pasadena. Joshua Tree feels close because you can hop on the ten and get right there. Um, but the or on the two ten, I guess. But uh, Channel Islands it is closer um, it, uh, mile wise. It just takes a little bit more doing. And I'd been to Catalina, as I'd imagine a number of you might have, um, uh, and that is the the Channel Island that's not actually part of Channel Islands National Park. So same range, same geography, but obviously Catalina is developed. You can buy saltwater taffy and go to an arcade or whatever. Um, but the other ones are are very remote um, and and very undeveloped. And so those comprise Channel Islands National Park. And I'd never been there. And I'd been in California for for over ten years um, because to get there. Um, you can, I guess, technically visit park property if you drive to the visitor center and, and walk in the front door, that is the park. But, but really the reason you're there is, is the water and then those islands and that requires a boat ride. So if you have your own, first of all, lucky you, um, and, and, and you know, that, that you can do, but if you, if you don't, you've got to uh, book a tour uh, and, and, you know, there's a, and also book a return trip. They'll drop you off. Uh, but this is not, <laughs> you, you got to also make for sure you find a way home. And sometimes that same boat doesn't come back for three more days. So it requires sort of a, a uh, hardier type of park visitor and, and a little bit more advanced planning than I often do. But uh, I felt very lucky to go out there when I did because it was right when they were doing a delisting of the Channel Island Fox, um, which had been super endangered uh, and and then finally found its way off the endangered species list. And that very rarely happens. Um, it was the fastest delisting for a mammal, I believe in the history of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so to see those foxes uh, would have been impossible just even a, a few years ago and now probable. I mean, there there's uh, uh, guard your muffins and your snacks because I had some very interested in, in what was in my backpack uh, there. They're all over the place um, now. So, so they have definitely returned and, and credit is, is hugely due to that park and to the scientists there and the biologists for uh, realizing that there was a problem and then taking kind of a complicated series of steps to address that problem, uh, but it, it is doing much better. Uh, there's a story I tell in the book that uh, is actually going to be on TV this Sunday. So it's, it's sort of a reverse version. Some of these were on TV first and then I wrote more of a behind the scenes account in the book. Uh, but there's a story I tell at Pinnacles, um, south of San Francisco, about the California condor and how even though it's been illegal to kill a condor long before even the Endangered Species Act, um, they were still dying and they were dying by bullets, not because they were getting shot by them, but because they were eating them. Um, when hunters hunt in California and elsewhere, uh, most ammunition that they use is lead-based. It's a lead bullet. And so it is good hunting practice, or often considered good hunting practice, to leave behind the remains of whatever you kill. You know, you cart out the bulk of the animal, but you leave what's uh, known as a gut pile. And with the idea that nature scavengers will be around to pick that up. And so uh, they, it took a while for people to realize that these condors were still dying of lead poisoning. And it's because they were eating 
the remains that had some of these fragments of lead bullets. So uh, a, a story I only found out about when I was researching the book, when I visited Pentacles, and if you've read the book, you've seen the story where I was very excited about a raven I saw. Um, the, the, the book ends without me having seen a California condor at all. I took a lot of pictures of a raven until a very kind, but also sort of sarcastic trail runner uh, let me know that I was, I was documenting the wrong bird. Um, and I was just there as a hiker that was just there for fun. Um, but now I have seen more condors than, than anyone probably ever will in their life because I went to Marble Canyon, Arizona, which is a popular condor site um, where, where they typically hang out in February and watch them trap and test these condors. The people who are doing this lead research trap them. Um, they, they test their blood lead levels. They almost always do have lead in their bloodstream. They treat them and then they release them. It's a cycle that will keep happening um, if, you do, if we don't change the ammunition. California has banned lead ammunition. So that's also happened since, since the year in which I was visiting the parks, although I do address this in the book. In 2019, California instituted the ban on lead ammo for hunting. Um, if you're target shooting or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but the California condor also lives in Arizona and Utah. Um, and so I thought this was funny that the, uh, the biologist I was talking to, who is a hunter first, he does not want to take anybody's guns. He likes hunting. He just wants people to change the bullets. He's like, man, the worst thing they ever did was name that bird the California condor. Because he's like, you don't know how hard that makes my job in Utah. In Arizona, they don't want to save the California condor, even though it is just as native to those places um, as it is to California. So um, uh, if, if we could go back in time, he, he wishes it would have just been called the American condor. Uh, the, uh, the furthest I traveled um, from Pasadena would uh, likely be um, uh, the, the one national park that's 7,000 miles from our nation's capital, uh, the National Park of American Samoa. Uh, just a fascinating place. and and one that I feel particularly lucky to have seen. Um, uh, and uh, the, in the book, I write mostly about um, the, the sort of interesting legal status that the citizens uh, of that territory have um, and how they're, they're not quite, uh, or they're not technically US citizens or US nationals, um, but the, uh, but just from a, I think I kind of minimize, or I don't talk enough probably about the nature of that park, which is stunning. I mean, it, it is it is really the, some of the cleanest water in the country, um, beautiful, uh, uh, you know, scenery and, and coastline. Um, the, I guess that's what I knew would be true for all of them, that they would all be beautiful. And they, they all were, there's not a bad one in the bunch. Um, and, and I think people sometimes focus a little bit too much on, on the ones on the Yosemites, on the Yellowstones, the ones that feel more bucket listy. But I promise you, you will not have a bad weekend uh, at any park you go to, whether that's one in California or, or one you plan a trip to elsewhere. Um, but it was how interesting they were that surprised me. I knew they'd be beautiful. I did not know they would be so interesting. And so uh, both ones that we did for the broadcast and then ones that I found uh, after the fact and looked up fascinating histories. Um, and so the uh, the challenge is when you when you set your premise being, I went to every national park in the country, but you kind of have to talk about all of them. And so there are some, um, Kings Canyon for one, that like probably get a little minimized in the book because you do have to talk about you know all of them and then you can only have so many pages and so much attention span. Um, but that's more of just like a, a housekeeping thing on my end. It, it is not a, uh, a judgment. I love, I've been back to Kings Canyon since then. I've been back to a number of the parks since my, my year of visiting them. I went to Olympic this summer um, and being back at a park like that, Olympic specifically in Washington state, uh, I felt like I saw a whole new place just because the weather was slightly different. And it's a big park. So there were whole areas I hadn't seen before. I've been back to Bryce Canyon a number of times and seeing that in the winter feels like a very different park than in the summer. Um, I think my my big California discovery though was Death Valley. I'd also never been there before. And, and I've been back uh, twice and it's just a fantastic park. It's, it's the largest of all the parks in the contiguous US, 3.3 um, million acres. I don't know if that's a branding thing where you, you call it Death Valley and you're like, oh, I don't know if I really wanna go to there. Life Valley seems seems a little bit more my speed, but uh, it's it's fascinating and just, just a, a treasure that's a, more of a four or five hour trip from Pasadena, but it's great. Uh, I wanna make sure I have time for questions. Um, and so uh, I see a few of them coming in. Uh, I may, if that makes sense to you, Michelle, pop over to those to make sure we get get those all in and then, then I can keep talking after that. But I, I, I'm i just so, uh, honored for, for all of you who took the time to read this and, and are uh, joining us now. I, I really 
appreciate that. And so I, I want to make sure that, that I answer any questions that you have. So um, I can see these here. Should I just pop over to them? Is that fine? Great. Um, so uh, Adrienne asks, uh, how long did it take to do all the parks? And did you do them in any particular order, intentionally or not? Um, and what prompted you to do this? So uh, the prompting of it was a bit of a shakeup in, in my personal life personal life of, of having very different plans for a year, which, which I think now we can all identify with. Who thought 2020 was going to go the way it did? Um, but my 2016 was going to be uh, the year I got married, and it ended up being the year I, I went to every national park in the country. And so when, when one of those uh, uh, ended up not happening, I was like, well, this seems like a good way to, to uh, uh, change things up for myself. So that, that was sort of the why. Um, and then the, the where my gosh, if I ever published a map of the route that I took, and the reason I have it is it would just be maddening because I was often chasing stories, not just weather and, and geography. So that it, those would be the, the two more obvious ways to visit the parks is do them in a geographical sequence or, or do them by season. But I found myself wanting to tell stories that only happened on certain days of the year. So Mount Rainier National Park in, in Washington State I was doing a story on the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, who it's actually a story I don't tell much in the book, but I did tell on air, um, who, who built a lot of the trails and the lodges that you see in the parks. And uh, then Secretary of Interior Sally Jewell was available at that park on one day in June because she was speaking at the University of Washington graduation the next day. And then there was another story I wanted to tell at Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee, and this is one I tell in the book, um, of, of the families who one day a year got to go back to the cemetery uh, across a, a lake that had been flooded during the creation of that park. Um, and, and that happened a week later. So what happened is I, I drove all the way back from Washington State to North Carolina and Tennessee to tell that story and then back again. So I crisscross, having, having passed Tennessee much earlier in the year. So it, it was a really confusing mess. Um, uh, certainly not a complaint. I love that I, I, I take a second chance to visit a lot of these places, but uh, it was a, uh, a route that was dictated more by story selection, less by any logic of, of a map. Uh, Garrett asks, uh, did you find your life partner who was like a national park? Thank you for asking, Garrett. Uh, no, I, I did not. Um, uh, but not, not, not that I've given up. Um, uh, it's it's uh, still on the hunt for that. Um, and then, oh, and then uh, Claire, Claire, by the way, it's not nobody's real. In most people's cases, I did not uh, use the real name. So the Claire that you're asking about is not actually named Claire. Um, and it's certainly that that wasn't uh, uh, anything uh, about that person. It's just you know, it's it's about a feeling. Sometimes things feel, you know, in, in a way like a like a national park, and, and sometimes they don't. Um, uh, Connie asks. Uh, you have a wall covering often as a background on CBS Sunday morning that showcases national parks. We were talking about this with a library crew before this started. I mean, it actually looks kind of similar to what Michelle had behind her, which are actually some really cool Pasadena cards that they've made up. Uh, Connie, sorry, I sort of trailed off while uh, reading her real question, but she's asking about a, uh, I have some postcards often behind me on CBS Sunday morning that are park themed. Um, those are, and that's all they are. They are postcards that I keep with me um, because when I'm on the road, if I'm doing something like a Zoom interview on our broadcast, which is for a while was all we were doing, I wanted something behind me and I didn't want it necessarily to be the decor of the Airbnb that I was staying at or whatever. Um, uh, so the park postcards were kind of an easy, neutral, sort of on brand uh, look for me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they're, they're made by, I think it's Ranger of the Lost Art. They sell them um, and they're, some of them are reproductions of historic uh, park posters, and then for its other parks that have been made in that style, which is kind of what you see with those Pasadena cards uh, that Michelle had, where they're they're done in the style of these 1930s posters. Um, uh, we've got uh, well, anonymous anonymous attendee. You're gonna you're gonna wonder if this is a relative of mine because it is a very complimentary question, but I'll, I'll read it because it's the next in line. You have a great sense of humor. Was this something you uh, cultivated or were born with? Also, how is your personal life now? Well, the second question is just less exciting, but the first one, thank you, mom. Um, and uh, uh, I guess it was, uh, you know, long before I was working at Sunday morning, I worked for this network called Current. Uh, they had studios at LA Center Studios. And then before that uh, at like Highland and Santa Monica. It's a cable network um, that uh, sadly does not exist anymore, but I did a comedy news show for them. So 
I've sort of always had that bent and I think that helped me hone some of those skills. We were doing something that if I was to flatter myself would say was in the vein of what a last week tonight with John Oliver does, that is a better show. Uh, but we were, we were in that mold where we were trying to be funny but also have a point um, and, and, and tell a story with, with some jokes thrown in. We were a little bit more uh, look and style wise, like something like The Soup where it was a, a clip show. So somewhere in between, you take those two shows, put them together, take away all the people who watch them. And then that was Infomania, um, which uh, well, no one on this chat will have heard of. Uh, uh, Magdalena asks, uh, did you know whether the national parks were adversely affected during the past administration? If so, how? What has Biden committed to recently? Uh, in terms of recently, I, I'm not aware of anything uh, on like the legislative front that's happened super recently. Um, in terms of the impacts over the, the past four years, I mean, uh, uh, the ongoing impact that, that has transcended administrations is climate change. I mean, if you were to ask, uh, and, and I did ask, and I think I referenced this in the book, John Jarvis, the former director of the National Park Service, he says that the, the greatest uh, challenge, greatest impact, I forget exactly how he phrases it, facing the national parks as a whole is climate change. There's, there's not one that's immune from its effect. You take a place like Joshua Tree, there's a future in which they have no more Joshua trees potentially because those can only grow at certain elevations with certain weather conditions. And as the planet warms, it's less likely that, that will happen. Glacier National Park will have no more glaciers. That is happening. And that, that certainly was not new over the past four years. There may be some policies that, you know, you could point to surrounding that, but but that has, has been an issue for a long time. Um, the uh, overcrowding, which also sort of transcends administrations, um, and actually is, is the most it's ever been right now, um, is, is a challenge facing the parks. Um, so I think there were some big worries that certain parks would be, you know, uh, done away with or whatever, but like, you know, the, the parks that existed when I went on my journey are all still there. Um, and if anything, there are, are there's more land protected, um, but the, uh, uh, the crowd, there's more people enjoying it, which on one hand, I'm very excited about. I'm, I'm thrilled anytime, especially a first timer sets foot in a national park. I just think that those, those can be life-changing experiences. And so I'm always happy when someone uh, does that. Uh, but the, um, the flip side of that is it comes with with trash and it comes with uh, trampling and, and it comes with two hour waits at the entrances. Right now, Yosemite, you have to have a permit to go to. And so that John Muir quote of the mountains are calling and I must go, it's not the mountains are calling and I must go Thursday at 3 p.m. because that's the only reservation I could get, but that's kind of how it is right now. Um, and I get it, uh, but I, 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 it's, I think we'll see that at more parks. That was sort of a COVID creation to, create distancing. And I think it will stick around post COVID. If, if I had to guess, it just seems like the crowding pandemic or not is intense enough to, that, to regulate how many people are hitting a trail at once, how many people are, are you know, going to be damaging some of these resources uh, it, with overcrowding and it will be a challenge a lot of them are dealing with. Although that's only true for like, I forget the exact stat, but it's a very small percentage of the parks experience a very high percentage of the visitation. So for every Yosemite, there's there's a Gates of the Arctic National Park, which is is, is uh, not not overrun with people. Um, so it's it's the people just tend to cluster uh, in a lot of spots. Um, uh, John asks, when your journey ended, how did you feel? How did you cope with that feeling? What adjustment was required to get back to reality? Uh, so mostly, I felt grateful. I felt grateful even as it was happening. I knew that this was something very special that I was very privileged and lucky to do, and that, that I I would never you know have a, have a chance like that again in my life. Um, uh, it wasn't clear to me that I would finish. I mean, at any park, whether it would be a broken leg or or you know, some family emergency or I'd run out of money or something, it, it wasn't a given that I would finish. But every time I, I you know, every day, every every month that it continued, I felt very lucky. And so when I was standing there watching that last sunset uh, at Point Reyes National Seashore, I just was mostly overwhelmed with that and overwhelmed with like the the kindness of all the the people I'd met along the way, whether that be rangers who were kind enough to answer my stupid questions and spend time with me, strangers I met on a trail. It just, it just was very uh, uh, impactful. And I've tried to carry that gratitude with me since. In terms of returning to reality, that didn't quite happen. Um, I, I have not paid a utility bill since I left Pasadena. Um, I, I have sort of continued to live on the road uh, in, you know, sometimes that's the hotel, sometimes that's an Airbnb. It's not changing every night. It may be a month here, a month there, but uh, I've 
I was sort of ready when uh, COVID hit to be done with that. And then all of a sudden, when everyone's working remotely, staying remote uh, made sense for me. So I've, I've actually continued to stay out on the road, um, not doing park exclusive stories anymore, but taking advantage sometimes of where work might send me and then hanging out in that place for a little longer. But I think I'm ready to to put some blaze leftovers in the in the fridge again. You know, you can't, can't eat the, the pizza and the donuts and the, and the s'mores all at once. Um, uh, Robert asks, um, can you recommend one or two underrated lesser known national parks? Uh, you know, there's a few that I, I guess I'll just go with underrated stuff, but like Biscayne National Park, I had a blast at. And even the rangers there kind of know that from the surface, that's that's a park that doesn't look like much. It just looks like the rest of South Florida, but the treasures of that park are underwater. Now it's a tough recommendation to give folks because from California, it's very far. And also it's uh, it requires some doing. What I loved about that park was what I was able to see underwater, which required getting scuba certified, uh, going out with a boat. I mean, that that's more of an investment of time and money. But if you can do that, uh, that that's a park that might not otherwise be on your list that, that for me ended up just being fascinating diving from shipwreck to shipwreck. Uh, in terms of a more uh, like more traditional nature-based park. A uh, Black Canyon of the Gunnison, I thought was really cool. I, that's definitely not one I've heard of. It's, it's not a very uh, visited park. Um, it's in Colorado. It is uh, it, it's something like the Grand Canyon is like twice as wide as it is deep. And this is twice as deep as it is wide. It's just a very narrow canyon. It's called Black Canyon because it's it's uh, the sun doesn't get to most of it for, for most of the day. It is it's just dark. Um, and uh, but very dramatic, uh, beautiful nature around there. That that whole area of the country is beautiful. So I like that a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I'll, I'll give a plug for my my home state one now. New River Gorge uh, is a beautiful part of West Virginia. Uh, great whitewater rafting. Uh, the the bridge itself is just just a, an interesting structure that blends well with that nature. So I, I like that one. Um, Pamela asks, how and what can we do to make sure that our national parks continue to get funding and support? And uh, I think part of it's visit them and, and encourage others to as well. Uh, in the chapter on diversity, I mentioned the effort that's uh, sadly did not happen for a while that is now happening more in full force, which is realizing that like as the demographics of our country change, you know, the parks should are and should be, you know, welcoming to everyone. And outside of just morally, that's the right thing. Like for the sake of the preservation of the parks, that's a necessary thing. Who would vote to protect a place that they've never felt welcome in, that they've never visited? And so to be able to uh, increase access to the parks um, and uh, and make sure that messaging is that that they are for everyone and make sure that everyone feels welcome when they're there. I think that's the best thing because it's, you know, it's, it's America's best idea, but it's an idea that could, that could change. I mean, it, it is not... Uh, we should not take them for granted. So it's it's partially to, you know, make sure that people continue to love, protect them. You know, currently right now they enjoy huge levels of of pop uh, like support and popularity across party lines. Who doesn't like the Grand Canyon? Everybody likes the Grand Canyon. So if some bill came up of like we're gonna get the Grand Canyon away, like people would speak up. Um, and so uh, that will only continue to be true as people continue to to visit and love these places. Um, so yeah, that would be that's the biggest thing. Um, but uh, there are the friend in the same way that the library has friends groups, the national parks uh, have friends groups, uh, sometimes on a park level, um, where it's like the Death Valley Conservancy or something like that. And then the National Park Foundation is sort of the big picture uh, organization there. So if you're looking to donate to someone, I'd say that's that's a, a you know a place that would happily take your money and, and puts that money to good use. Um, uh, what do we got? David here says, uh, hi, we will be leaving to finish the next three national parks for us, except Samoa and Virgin Islands. Um, wait, we will be leaving next to finish the last or, oh, hey, looks like we are on a similar journey then. Um, uh, any suggestions for gates of the Arctic, gates of the Arctic or Kobuk? So, um, the, uh, the parks that David's referencing there are, are two of the most, uh, remote parks, two of the least visited parks, gates of the Arctic and Kobuk Valley are sometimes so, uh, get so low visitation that they don't track the visitors. It's like, how, how do you even know um, to get to those parks? You have to arrive on a boat or, or a, a plane. Um, they're not connected by road to the rest of Alaska. Um, Gates of the Arctic does not have a gate. There is no ranger there to, to take your ticket or give you a map or whatever. Um, 
So now that, I mean, the recommendation would be just like book that as early as possible um, because you know, you're, you, you're not rolling up in your rental car to either of those two parks. You are having to, to charter um, something. This is a case where I lucked out because I was covering a couple of those parks for the show. I, I tagged along with a ranger for part of that. Uh, and then for the other part, I, I booked, uh, I forget the name of the airline, but Alaska has a lot of charter kind of airlines. To get from one to another, I was trying to get from Katmai National Park to the, or the Lake Clark National Park. And it really felt like taking an Uber pool where you just get in one of these airlines. I mean, it's, it's like a six seater plane. And they, it was the day that they were doing trainings for like lunchroom workers in, uh, in Alaska. And so you'd pick up a worker and then land in some town, you, you know, that barely looks like a town and some other worker gets on and then they drop off a chef somewhere else and then someone else gets on. And so then eventually you're just like, oh, and this is your stop. Um, so it's just a very, the opposite of LAX in every way where you're just yeah, sort of at, at uh, the whim of the pilot schedule and, and you feel lucky to have gotten a seat and uh, it's a lot more fun that way. Um, uh, Pamela is, I won't even read this because it feel, it's, but it's a very nice compliment. Thank you, Pamela, appreciate it. Um, Tiffany asks, uh, uh, have you climbed Mount Whitney? I have not. Um, and I was watching uh, the presentation that they had uh, uh, with the LA Times earlier, I guess that was last week uh, with the library and and the writer for the Times has done it every year. So now I just feel like such a chump that I've never done it once. She's, she's doing it uh, uh, once a year. So it's on my list, but I, I have never climbed uh, Mount Whitney. Um, Anonymous attendee asks, how is your cameraman doing? Uh, Efrain, who is, is uh, the star of the chapter uh, on, on borders in particular, um, but also just, just uh, uh, was a great companion to have throughout the journey and, and is featured a, a few times in the book. Uh, he's doing great. He's now a full-time uh, uh, camera, like, camera, camera person feels wrong for him, I guess, videographer uh, for a Sunday morning. He shoots a lot of segments. Um, and now it's kind of hard to book him. Uh, he uh is uh is in demand he lives in new york um and so yeah if you're if you're a fan of sunday morning you're a fan of his work because you you've he's popped up in a lot of different uh segments everything from celebrity interviews to uh filming uh you know museums uh but i, I know you know he, he's got he's got a parky soul so i think and, and he's mentioned to me last time i talked that he's eager to get back out there again and for us to do one of our nature adventures but we've shot some international segments together as well but haven't haven't seen him in a year and a half sadly uh, nor have i seen any of my new york colleagues um uh linda asks how expensive did it get to see all the alaska parks since many are fly-in only uh it, it's not just the alaska parks a place like dry tortugas in in florida is also fly-in only or or boat in um and so there is this idea that hey these parks are for everyone and like sometimes that's more in theory than in practice because because it takes money to get to a lot of these places. Um, uh, it takes money, but like, I guess the way of looking at those Alaska parks is that they are well used by the local population. I mean, the the uh, Anubiat people who live there in Alaska use that park for food. I mean, they're, they're caribou hunting there. In terms of a tourism visit, yeah, it's more expensive. If you wanna come from anywhere not that's not Ambler, Alaska to Kobuk Valley, it takes some doing. Um, so yeah, that can be, you know, in the hundreds of dollars, um, uh, you know, but not, not horribly expensive because when you get there, you're probably camping. Um, so, uh, but even, even to get to a Yellowstone, yeah, it can, it can certainly, uh, add up. Uh, so, which is also some of that's tied into how do you increase access? You know, that it's cost money to get to Jackson Hole. So yeah, there's no easy way around that. Um, when uh, Donna asks, uh, when you stay, where did you stay um, when visiting the parks and how did you, uh, how long did you stay in each one and what was the most beautiful scene moment of your year? Well, the second question is impossible to answer. Um, although I'd say the most memorable would be the lava. The lava at Ho Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, seeing mother nature give birth is amazing. There's no other park like it. There's no other place where you get to see lava. Um, certainly not that up close. Uh, it's also not a consistent feature of that park. I mean, the lava is always there, but it's not always erupting. I kind of actually don't know what the status is right now, it, but it, it went quiet for a while. Um, and so the experience I had, you couldn't, you, no one could duplicate, I think like a year and a half later when it, when it stopped erupting. I think now it is again, um, but that was the most memorable hour um, just because there was nothing else like that. There are other pretty lakes. There are other impressive vistas, mountain peaks. There's no other place like lava. Um, and in terms of how long did I stay in each one? always longer than the average visitor stayed. Um, but that's often because the average visitor stay is very short. So if you take a place like the Grand Canyon, it's, I mean, it's, it's in the hours. People hit that park 
on their way to Vegas. Um, and uh, and then that's true for a number of parks. So you'd be surprised how short that number is. A place like Isle Royale, as far as I know, in the contiguous US has the longest visitation. It's a few days. And that's because Isle Royale is another park that you have to fly into or boat into. It, it takes some doing. So people try and uh, extend their time there. Um, the uh, uh, Suzanne asks, um, did I camp out and take tours or did I explore the parks on your own? Uh, curious if you stayed in hotels, motels, or other accommodations such as at Yurt. Um, uh, were your trips pre-COVID or, or during COVID? They were all pre-COVID, although I've been to the parks during COVID, um, uh, uh, but what you're reading in the book is all pre-COVID. Um, and it was a mixture of camping out and taking tours. I mean, a place like Katmai National Park, I was planning to uh, stay in the lodge there until I looked up how much that lodge cost. Uh, and it's 700 something a night. I mean, and they know they've got you. It's, it's, uh, it's a concessionaire who does it. It's not like the US government trying to charge you $700 a night. It's, it's whoever runs that lodge, but it's an old fishing lodge. I mean, it's not much to look at. It's not like the, the Iwani or something like that at Yosemite. Um, so I was like, well, for $700, I can, I can go to REI and buy all new everything. Um, and so there were, I didn't quite do that, but there were some camping things I didn't have with me that I, I, was able to justify because all told that was going to be $200 uh, and not the 700 a night uh, to stay there. So it was a mix. I camped at places like um, uh, North Cascades. Um, I was in hotels more than I'd like, and that's because of the, the CBS Sunday morning side of things. You know, when we were filming, I needed a safe place to store gear. I needed Wi-Fi. I needed FedEx to send back the camera cards. I theoretically needed a shower to have the viewers not complain too much. So uh, it was a, a mix of those things, but sometimes put me in, in very modest hotels, but uh, in, a, in a Hampton Inn type place. Um, anonymous attendee asks, what's the best way to get a reservation to visit the WAVE? Uh, I've tried and failed at that. The WAVE is actually not a uh, park service. Um, uh, it's BLM, I think, but it's a, a place in Utah. It's a very popular spot um, and, and good luck. I mean, I feel like your odds of winning the Powerball are, are better than getting a reservation to the WAVE. I, I wish I could help you, but I, I do not know. I've tried and failed on that. Um, Anne asks, do the park seem to have enough rangers to teach visitors, children, uh, about unique aspects of the park in talks or programs, or visitors pretty much on their own? Uh, using guidebooks, kiosks, whatever, uh, both. I mean, uh, if I could go back in time to 2016, Connor, and tell them what to do, I'd say, man, take pictures of those signs. Because as an author, I was trying to remember the, the fact that parks actually do a pretty good job of having a lot of interpretive signs out on the trail. And I think my embarrassing instinct is to kind of like read it, forget it. And then I'm like, wait, why are the Smoky Mountains smoky? What's happening there? Or like, what is like, how does the, what is, what's up special about Badwater Basin at Death Valley? So I wish I would have photographed those signs to remember them. I kind of went back uh, and had to do more research than I should have. Uh, but yeah, the campground presentations, I'd say if anything, they're under attended. Um, those, take advantage of that. If you've got a ranger doing a talk, like there's generally something. The night sky presentations at Great Basin are amazing. I know other parks do them as well, but those are ones of the ones that, uh, those are some of the ones I'd gone to. So yeah, those are, uh, uh, seems to be a mix, but I don't think that there's, when they're short staffed, it's not necessarily for interpretive programs. It's more for things like maintenance and, and uh, yeah, there, there's a whole host of, of uh, departments that seem like they're hurting more. I guess that's from my outsider's perspective. I, I honestly don't know, but it seems like the Rangers do a good job. And at Joshua Tree, actually, this is a piece we aired on Sunday morning during the pandemic. Those Rangers who would normally be leading tours were doing virtual programs. So you could sign up and book a field trip and have your, your fifth grade class from from Florida, you know, a class that's never going to visit Joshua Tree, or certainly not on a field trip, was able to, you know, with an iPad, the rangers showing them the cacti and giving them a taste of California when they were all the way across the country. So uh, I, I have a feeling that might stick around post-COVID as well. Uh, it seems like they may be, uh, they're recognizing the value of sharing that experience. And, and it's getting close to six, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer this one as well. And this is the last one we've got here in the chat. Um, do you think you might do anything similar in the future? Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, I, I, I like a challenge. I like a list. Um, before I went to every national park in the country, I went to uh, every, all 99 of Jonathan Gold's 99 essential LA restaurants. I wrote a rap about it. Um, you can find that on YouTube. It is the beginning and end of my rap career. Um, it is very ridiculous, but I, I mean, who rhymes, like I'm rhyming gelato with Prada. And I mean, it's, 
that's to the, it's to the tune of uh, 99 problems, except it's 99 restaurants. Um, I, it's both, it's the creative work that I am simultaneously proudest and most ashamed of. Cause it's hard, you try rhyme all 99 of those things. Um, sadly, like a third of those have closed, even pre COVID it's, it's tough to keep a restaurant open. But uh, uh, I bring the Euro pain in Pasadena, I believe is a line. So there's, uh, there's some, there's, a couple of shout outs uh, a crowd here may enjoy. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a list guy. I like lists. Um, uh, and I guess I'll, I'll, Michelle, if you've got any questions, I'm just trying to be respectful of everyone's time here. And it looks like it's six, but I, I can, you know, I could talk parks forever. So, so you let me know. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, in libraries, we're all about lists as well. We love those. So we, we certainly agree with you there. Um, before I, uh, we conclude, and I turn this back over to Mayor Gordo, I, I'd love to just ask you what's next for you. Uh, for me, um, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm talking to you from a, a Hyatt in uh, Sacramento. Um, and uh, I was just filming a piece on fire lookouts for CBS Sunday morning, a piece that will air later this summer on the people who sit up in the towers um, in Klamath National Forest as where we were, but, but it's, there's a number of national forests in California where it's gonna, it's gonna be a big fire season and, and, and you know, I, I, there's, there's humans up there doing a job that you'd think would have been somehow replaced with drones or satellites or whatever, but apparently it's a, a human set of eyes or sort of the best of early detection, catching that smoke. It's also an interesting lifestyle to live up in those lookouts. Um, as a visitor, you can now rent some of the decommissioned lookouts um, as, a, uh, as like a camping destination. I think most of those are booked up for this summer, but if you ever wanted to do that for next summer, Shasta National Forest has some. Um, uh, there's a few parks that have them, but they're more commonly found in forests and state parks. Um, but yeah, you can you can rent some of those lookouts. So that I've got a, a slate of Sunday morning stories still coming. You know, working on some book stuff, but I'll I'll, I'll wait uh, to to sort of say more about that because the book world's a long world. I mean, you know, anything I'm working on now won't come out for years. But yeah, there's there's a few irons in the fire there. And then just really, you know, I, I I'm so grateful to have a chance to do something like this. There was this book came out the week that every national park and bookstore closed and library. Um, so it was a very strange time to release a book. And in normal times, I would have liked to have thought that, you know, I might have been able to do a signing at Romans or something like that. I, I've, I've attended those. It would have been cool to, to be a part of one. And then all, all of that went away. And, um, uh, and so in some ways it didn't feel real. I still haven't seen the book in a library, in any library. I've seen some photos. I have a friend who works at the Studio City Library. She sent me a picture there. I've seen some of them, but I haven't been into one to see it on a shelf. I've finally seen the paperback in bookstores, but you know, the, it, it, this makes it feel, the fact that, and thank you so much for all these smart questions, you know, that are coming in, that, that makes it feel real. That makes me believe that like, oh, this isn't a thing that like they just printed out at Kinko's and gave to me. This actually exists out in the world, which is cool. Um, uh, and I think that would have felt more normal had I had like a book tour. Uh, but instead, it's been great. People have sent me pictures of the book uh, in, in fun places. I think maybe because it's an outdoors themed book, it's something that you might take on vacation. And so that almost makes it feel like the Amelie gnome or whatever, where people are like, here's a picture of it at Great Sand Dunes. Here's a picture of it beside of an alligator at Everglades. That's great. Um, which has been fun, so. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Mayor Gordo. Yeah, Connor, this, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the stories and, and let me tell you, uh, we can arrange that book signing at Broman's or Pasadena City Hall anytime you like, um, yeah. and, and uh, maybe bring over some Lucky Boys or <laughs> so some of your other favorite meals. Uh, Lucky Boys is uh, one of the, the favorites in town, as you know. Um, so we would love to welcome you back to Pasadena and uh, have a book signing uh, somewhere in our city. You're, you're choosing. Um, and in the meantime, be careful with all those politicians up in Sacramento. They're, uh, they're constantly trying to legislate something up there. So <laughs> putting a good word for uh, park space and open spaces, as, as I know you will. Um, so thank you. And uh, we'll look up your, your rap uh, and try and pick up some of the lines that uh, we can use down here in Pasadena. So it, it's, great. it's great to have you. And we'd love to have you in Pasadena for a book signing. Thank you for your time and, and thank you for your, your gift of this great book. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us today. You'll find us on YouTube and we'll send out a link afterwards.